Welcome to Work Matters, where we explore what leaders can do to make work more productive, valuable, meaningful, and impactful. I am your host, Thomas Bertels. In today's episode of the Work Matters podcast, I am talking to Jeff Wald about his book, The End of Jobs. Jeff is the founder of Work Market, an enterprise software platform to manage freelancers, as well as several other technology companies. He is an active angel investor, startup advisor, board member, and speaker. Early in his career, he held leadership roles in the finance industry, including hedge fund Barrington Capital Group, venture capital firm Glenrock, and JP Morgan's M&A Group. He is the author of The End of Jobs, The Rise of On-Demand Workers and Agile Corporations. In our discussion, we explore what are the forces driving the growth of on-demand work and what are the challenges and limitations. We also talk about how leaders should look at deciding whether a job should be full-time or not and explore how the adoption of AI and robotics will impact the overall job market. I hope you enjoy this show, and if you do, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and share it at least with one other person. Jeff, welcome to the show. It is great to be here. Thank you for having me. So in your book, The End of Jobs, you talk about on-demand work and you make the argument that the rapid growth of on-demand work will continue uh, at the expense of full-time work. What are the forces driving that growth? Well, look, we certainly think that on-demand work will continue to grow. I would challenge the notion that it's been rapid. I think it's been kind of slow and steady. And so that just may be a semantics thing, but Look, there will be increased penetration driven by a few things. One is psychographics. The kinds of people that want to be independent continues to grow. Two is just the inherent nature of the company and how companies will always skew towards more variable labor costs, lower labor costs. I know that's shocking that companies want to drive down their costs. And three, I think you'll see continued regulatory clarity. I don't know which way that clarity will go. It actually seems to vacillate industry or administration by administration, but there will be a little bit more clarity. And even if that clarity ends up being more anti-gig worker from a company standpoint, pro-gig worker from a worker standpoint, the clarity helps drive decision-making. And so once people understand exactly where the line is, then they will be more comfortable. When people don't know where the line is, they don't want to even step onto the field. So whether it is people feeling more comfortable and more engaged from a psychographic standpoint to be independent, or two, companies continuing to look to variabilize their labor force, or three, the regulatory clarity, I think all three of them continue to drive the slow and steady increase in the gig economy. So when I did my research for the show, I was, I was really positively surprised to learn that the origins of your business work market that you started in 2010 and ultimately sold to ADP goes back to the work of Ronald Coase, seminal work, The Nature of the Firm, which takes a look at why companies choose to take on some activities and source others and has the idea of transaction cost versus coordination cost. And uh, Coase concluded back in 1937 that businesses are better off paying fixed resources to get the work done. When you were at Harvard, you decided to take a fresh look at whether those conclusions are still valid. What did you find? I found that it was way too difficult for me to do. That's the first thing I found. I found that I am not smart enough to sit there and rewrite a Nobel laureate's paper. But the thesis behind me trying to rewrite it was his conclusions were the transaction costs were too high. The onboarding and offboarding of employees, the contracting, the finding new people. And when we think about all the advances we've had technologically since 1937, Online ads, applicant tracking systems, the ability to separate signal from noise, mobile applications, search algorithms, blah, blah, blah. Clearly, the transaction costs have dramatically shrunk. Now, have they shrunk to the level at which firms should start outsourcing? Well, I think the answer to that question is certainly yes, in some industries for some functions. But what I don't think Coast spent a huge amount of time on is what is the biggest driver of that, and that is the regulatory environment. Because the regulatory environment is certainly, while the transaction costs have decreased, the regulatory environment has become more of an overhang 
in this space. One of the things you're probably alluding to is, I guess, the discussion that we're seeing playing out at Uber, right? Whether those uh, independent drivers are truly independent or actually de facto employees. Absolutely. Whether it's Prop 22 in California, whether it's other states taking different actions themselves, whether it's the wage and hours division at the Department of Labor issuing a clarifying memo, which doesn't clarify what the last clarifying memo said. And there's just there's a lot of vacillation on the federal level and there's a lot of clamping down on the state level where the states tend to want to describe people or classify people as employees and not gig workers. And the reason for that is pretty simple. It's the money. It's just the money, right? I, I don't, let me take that back. You know, I'm sure there are many state bureaucrats that actually care about the worker and want to make sure the worker's being protected and not abused. But in most of these circumstances, the worker actually has the power and is not being abused. But the state loses out from a tax revenue standpoint. That certainly has driven more pro full-time employee anti-gig worker legislation and regulation at the state level. One of the most interesting things about your book, I thought, was something that you call the labor equation, which is really a framework for leaders to figure out what's their resource mix and, and where should they source it from. What are the elements of that equation? Well, I'll first tell you a quick story, which is at the work market office, I went all beautiful mind and I actually wrote a bunch of calculus system of equations up on the window in marker trying to create an actual equation that we could utilize. And strangely, the person that taught me calculus actually showed up to my office once and saw the window. And she looks and she goes, what's this? I said, oh my God, it's a labor equation. It's a series of system of equations and this and that. And she looks at me, she looks at the window, she looks back at me and she goes, this is gobbledygook. This is, this is nothing. You, you don't remember a single thing I taught you. And she was very comfortable saying it because the person was my mother. And she's an advanced calculus professor. And she was not impressed with the first draft of the labor equation, I will tell you that. That said, actually using calculus to determine a system of equations that we can use to actually quantify what the labor equation may be, leaving that aside, in the abstract, companies are looking at what is the ramp up time it takes for a full-time employee? If it takes six months for someone to really understand how to do this job, well then clearly we're not gonna engage a gig worker. If someone can become productive in a couple hours, well that favors the gig worker. What is the amount of institutional knowledge needed? Do you need to touch all different kinds of parts of the organization in order to be effective in this job or can you do it as a siloed function? More parts of the organization touch tend to be an employee more siloed gig worker. How long is this project or piece of work? Is this something that is an ongoing piece of work? Clearly that's an employee. Is it a discrete piece of work that can be done in a very well-defined period of time? Well, that tends to be more gig work. What is the regulatory environment? What are the costs? What are the touch points to customers? What are blah? When you start doing all of these different variables, that's what we go through in chapter six, you can start to I guess if you were smarter than me, come up with actual calculus equations and derivative functions and a host of other things, or we could just think about them in the abstract and talk about, well, does this tend to be more of a gig worker? Does this tend to be more of an employee? I think that's super helpful. One, I guess, other consideration I'm curious in your opinion about is I had a client of mine say, well, you know, what we found this as we might start the business and we thought about like, what's our sourcing model, we realized that typically the best people in the world on a given topic probably already have a job somewhere else. And so they looked at the sourcing model and, and decided that they basically want to go for a fully outsourced strategy. Right? So it's just a core leadership team, 10 people, and everything else gets sourced. That's obviously like an extreme example, but I thought the consideration that the best people in the world typically already have a, a job or work somewhere else I think is quite interesting. Is that something you would factor into your equation? Certainly. You know, Thomas, when we look at history and you look at this vacillating supply and demand power balance between workers and companies, most of the time the power lies with companies. The companies just have more power in that relationship because there are more humans than there are jobs. 
Therefore, there's a supply and demand imbalance. There are more people that want to do the job, and there are 100 people that want to do it, and there are only 50 jobs. Therefore, the fifth person that needs the 50 jobs has power. If that situation is reversed, there are 100 jobs and only 50 people that want to do it, the 50 people have power. When we see that dynamic play out, where the worker, because of a supply and demand imbalance, have the power, they tend to want to work in an on-demand capacity. They tend to want to say, I'll work for you when I want, how I want, every now and again, but I'm going to work for multiple people. In any your example, the best in the world. If they're the best in the world, there's a supply and demand imbalance. People want to tap into their knowledge, their expertise, whatever. They're not taking a full-time job at one place. They're setting up a consultancy. They're, you know, engaging as an independent contractor here, a consultant there, an advisor here. That's what people do when there's a supply and demand imbalance and the worker has the power. And so you'll see this in certain technologies, in certain geographies. And whenever you see it, you see people tend to work more in an on-demand capacity. So it certainly becomes a part of the labor equation because if there's a big supply and demand imbalance, I may not have a choice. Yeah, I think that also ties to, I think, another idea that you talk about in the book, this notion of total talent management really managing all the labor resources, whether they're full-time or they're on-demand. I think it's an intriguing concept since, in theory, it expands like a leader's options for addressing a, a particular staffing need. But what does it take to be successful with a total talent management approach? Total talent management is why ADP bought work market. Look, ADP, everyone thinks about them as a payroll firm. Uh, and they certainly are that. They're by far the world's largest. They're also by far the world's largest HR software company. So how do we use software to manage our full-time employees? ADP's got the by far largest customer count and some of the best software in the world. And they wanted to add on to that software to manage your on-demand worker. And so that was the total talent management. I can look at full-time, part-time, temp, freelance, all in one dashboard. I don't know that that vision has really come to pass, this notion of total talent management. I think it, it works in the abstract, I'm not sure that it is working overly well in practice. Um, these labor streams usually have nothing to do with each other. People tend not to move from one part to the next. It's not like you were a full-time employee and you become a freelancer for a company. Of course it happens, but it's not something that happens at scale. And so there are some companies that are doing it, but I think it is a minority of the use cases here. It is something to aspire to of total talent management of understanding, hey, where are all of the resources, all of the skills that I have at my disposal in order to get work done and what's the right way to engage them? Because as a company, obviously costs are a big factor, but I want to get the work done. I need to deliver the work to my customer in order to generate revenue. And at some point, I am indifferent as to how that work gets done. Are you a full-time employee, a part-time, a contractor, a, t a freelancer? It doesn't matter. I just need the work done. And so having at your fingertips one system at which you can access all of the skills available to you is certainly powerful. We just don't have that many people doing it yet. One of the larger themes in the book is that any type of work can be broken down into right, individual tasks and that technology has been accelerating that, that trend of fragmentation, really enabling companies to stitch together all these tasks at scale. But we also know, right, over the last six, days, six decades through research, that fragmenting that work into tiny bits and pieces also leads to lower rates of engagement and, and a reduced sense of accountability because the worker doesn't own the entire piece. Do you see any examples of firms going against this trend of, of breaking work apart and, and trying to reintegrate those tasks to make the work more motivating? That's a really good question. No is the short answer. I would first say, look, can every single work be broken down into its component tasks? Maybe. But is it currently? No, of course not. We still have artisans and we still have people that do everything from the beginning to the end. Has AI allowed us to identify, even in professional service engagements, the ability to start breaking things down into tasks? The answer is sure. 
is that a great customer service experience? Well, here's the expert on greeting you, and here's the expert on intaking you, and here's the expert on fixing it, and here's the expert on offboard. No, no, no. Nobody wants that experience. People want somebody holding their hand through their entire service experience. So I'm not sure exactly where we will end up here, but in terms of a people taking things that were broken into tasks and reintegrating, that I have not seen. I just have seen people not break things up as much as they could. Because as a part of this equation, right, not the labor equation, mind you, different equation, let's talk about. If we think about how new technologies actually impact jobs, because this was another major theme of the book, there's a tendency to say, oh, this new thing exists, therefore all these jobs are going to go. And that's just not ever the way it breaks down. It doesn't happen that way. There is a, an equation about how this will happen. And we can you know, dive into that a bit later. But a part of that equation is the customer service interaction. As an example, when the ATM came out, it took 25 years for the ATM to achieve full penetration in the banks in the United States of America. And when it did, everyone thought, oh, all the bank tellers are going to go. The ATM doesn't dis hide, disguise what it's trying to be. It's an ATM, automated teller machine. It's a machine that automates the job of the teller. That's what it is. And 25 years after the ATM achieved total penetration, we have more bank tellers today than we did in 1995 when it achieved full penetration. And people go, wait a minute, why? Well, the why is, look, if I walked into Citibank and all that was there was in a series of ATMs, not a human to talk to, I could accomplish everything I needed to accomplish and I would walk out. But if I walk into Chase and someone goes, oh, hey, how are you? And swipe my card, Jeff, how are you? You've been with us for 30 years, blah, blah. Would you like a lollipop? Where am I going to go back to? I'm going to Chase. I like lollipops. So the customer's experience has to be a part of this, this thought process as we think about how technology will displace jobs. And the same is true about work disaggregation. Could we do everything? Sure. Will you end up with a bad customer experience and therefore your competitor that did it the other way is going to win customers? Yeah. And so we need to be mindful of all of those things. Yeah, you mentioned technology. Everybody's talking about AI in your perspective. Will that change this ongoing transition towards more gig work, less full-time work? I think there are two very distinct trends that will both impact the labor market. I'm not sure that they will feed on each other in any statistically important way, but I will be happy to make the statement that AI will have, and robotics, however we want to qualify this fourth industrial revolution, it will have no net impact on jobs, no net losses. There will be jobs lost, let's be clear but there will be more jobs created and gained. And so I appreciate the call of the day is to freak out that AI is going to take everybody's job. It will not in the near nor medium term. In the long term, all bets are off. No one is in any position to say what the world of work is going to look like in 30, 40 years. But in the next 5 to 20 years, there's not going to be a huge number of jobs lost. There will be jobs lost but there will be more jobs created. I think you're absolutely right. There's no jobs for prompt engineers, and I'm sure there's going to be plenty of jobs to make sure the algorithms are not biased and so forth, right? So I think it's going to probably net-net create more higher value work and, and take out the lower value work. In your book, you call it the first service revolution, right? Uh, do you mind maybe just recapping so like a little bit the, the logic that, that got you to coin that term? Well, sadly, that did not did not take off. We keep calling these things industrial revolutions, the change of an industrial process. We will have industrial processes be changed because of AI, but AI will impact services industries much more than industrial industries. And so we're stuck calling them industrial revolutions because we've had three industrial revolutions. And so everyone is calling this the fourth industrial revolution. I do think that we should think about this as the first services revolution because it is revolutionizing the way services are imagined, delivered, 
and charged. Obviously, like people have, right, can see that every day, right? The Uber driver, the Lyft driver, or, or the Grubhub delivery person, those are all gig workers. They're not on the payroll. Do you think that gig work model is going to grow in, in other areas where we haven't seen that before, for example, manufacturing? It's interesting. I was actually on the phone with a CHRO at a mid-sized manufacturing company asking me this exact question earlier this week. I said, how do I use gig workers to change the manufacturing operation? I feel like we're going to fall behind and we have a labor shortage. How can I use gig workers? And I was like, you can't. You just can't. The regulatory environment wouldn't allow it. You can't have somebody on your manufacturing line that is a full-time employee standing next to somebody who's a 1099. Full stop, you cannot do that. And so are there ways that she can use scheduling software to schedule people in for two-hour shifts, four-hour shifts, as opposed to their standard 12-hour shift? They run two 12-hour shifts. Yes, that she can do. And so there's a lot of really amazing software out there to help quick serve restaurants, other kind of frontline workers, nurses, and people in retail do this shift work at a much more granular level. Can you try to bring that into a manufacturing environment? Yeah, you can. But as with any change, the change itself is not necessarily just does a piece of technology exist to allow me to do this? The change is what is the business process and how does this business process need to adjust? So can I find you a bunch of workers that are sitting there willing to work a two hour shift, but not a 12 hour shift? Of course I can. Will that work with your business process to have shift changes every two hours and not the entire shift, but just 20% of the shift leave and a different group come in? Maybe not. That may not work from your business process standpoint. The technology worked, the people were ready to do it, but the business process may not allow it. And so gig work in a manufacturing environment and other environments where it has not been tried is very challenging. One of the things that we dealt with a lot at work market, and we were by far the largest piece of software to manage an on-demand labor force, is if you weren't currently doing it, there was no need for me to spend time with you. Because I would get that call, Thomas, all the time. Hey, we're thinking of transforming our labor force. Can you come in and talk with us? And for the first two or three years, as a young startup, of course you go and have that conversation. Of course I'm going to jump on a plane and go meet with the C-suite and whiteboard out how we can transform your labor force. But after a couple years of doing it, and it never once leading to a sale, I mean, at some point, even I'm smart enough to go, well, this is not the highest and best use of my time. And so when I got that phone call, hey, we're thinking of transforming our labor force, I would say, well, good luck with that. You have fun now. Take care. I wouldn't get involved. Now, if you currently had a ton of freelancers and you didn't know who was where, who signed what legal agreement, who's working on what, who's good at what, who do we owe money to, if you had an efficiency or a compliance issue, I'm there for you. I'll be there lickety split. And I'm there for software that can really increase your efficiency and decrease your compliance risk within moments of being put in place. That I will do every day. But if you don't currently have the pain point, if you don't currently engage that type of labor force, you're not changing anytime soon. That also kind of indicates that people are maybe not as strategic in this space as maybe they should be. I find that interesting, right? That there's like a, a strategy gap in a way. I mean, maybe. I'll, I'll challenge that a little bit. Look, the meetings I were having were strategy meetings, right? They were trying to think through how do we transform our labor force. They just ran into impediments. And whether those impediments were business process related, whether they were regulatory related, whether they were customer touch points, whatever they were, they ran into roadblocks that they couldn't get through. It's not from a lack of strategic thinking, it's from a lack of reality and how do we actually do this? Because every CEO's always had the thought, how do I transform my labor force? How do I get a more variableized cost structure? But sometimes you run into the reality of, well, there really isn't a way to do this. 
that in the long term benefits my business because I'm going to get I'm going to have labor unrest, I'm going to have unhappy employees, I'm going to get sued by the Department of Labor, I'm going to have a workers comp issue, I'm going to have a class action lawsuit, whatever it is, and the decisions made that the highest and best use of time is to keep things the way Ronald Coase initially <laughs> envisioned and to have a high fixed cost structure and a centralized uh, operating unit. Obviously, there are some regulatory barriers. And in the U.S., right, it's a large labor market. I guess you have both the federal level and the state level where there are different flavors. But how does this look around the world? Because the forces of technology and might work being more fragmented probably play out, right, whether you're in Europe or in Asia or in the States. What are you seeing around the world? Is, is this gig work topic slowly picking up? Are countries erecting barriers to gig work? How is this playing out elsewhere? So I don't see a lot of new barriers going up. There are clearly, if we think about the EU, a lot of very, very strong worker protections. Right? And that's, that's just a choice. Right? We get to live in these societies where we get to choose either directly or choose the men and women that are going to write the laws that help govern our societies. And if we want a society that is not as flexible, that is not as profit-driven, that has more social safety net, we can choose that, right? We can put in place the regulation and tax policies that deliver that kind of econ economy and society. And that has been broadly, not to you know paint with too broad a brush here, but broadly that's been the choice that the Europeans have made. Okay, well, that has implications. It has implications that are positive and some that are negative. But those are choices. The choices that we're seeing in APAC are, tend to be, over the last 20 to 30 years, more kind of free market and less protective of the workers. I guess, ironically, given that you have a bunch of communist regimes there, whether it's in Vietnam uh, or some of the other countries in Southeast Asia and obviously China. Um, but I have not seen a ton of worker protection regulation in that regard. If anything, we would make the statement that they have fewer worker protections in Asia. So you tend to see tremendous worker protection in the EU, kind of the middle ground, and I would say a pretty decent balance in the United States, or let's just say North America, and very few worker protections in most other places. That is a very broad generalization, though. Besides the regulatory concerns, I would imagine there's also a, a huge concern around control and risk, being able to have access to that right, labor force or labor resource when you need it. And from a risk perspective, we all have seen these horror stories of, I don't know, the Booz Allen contractor who uploaded all the secret Pentagon files and so forth, right? Is that something in your discussions with business leaders that they are nervous about? In other words, it's less about the, right, the pushback from the workforce or whether people are going to go on strike and it's really more it's like the loss of control that, that they're fearing. The short answer to the question is yes, but not because they may engage a more on-demand labor force. I think the notion that a worker won't do X, Y, or Z because he or she is a full-time employee, I think if you think that the general zeitgeist has been lost on you over the last 20 years. So I'm not sure that the labor classification gives you any kind of protection there, whether it's a outright negative action, like downloading a bunch of files and uploading them to the public, or just stealing secrets or this or that. I'm not sure that we would see any data that says on-demand labor workers do that at any rate different than your full-time employees. If anything, they would do them less because they do have less access. Yeah. Uh, if you were like look into your crystal ball and make a predictions like right, 20, 25 years down the road, where do you think we're going to end up in this right, full-time versus gig work discussion? I think gig work will continue to grow at a slow and steady rate. I think we're reaching the point of saturation 
in the gig market. I don't. I, I think it'll peak right now in the corporate market. It's about 21, 22 percent. Anyone that's out there saying, "Oh, gig work's going to make 50 percent of the labor force," it's just moronic. I think it peaks somewhere in maybe the 30s, low 30s, somewhere in that neighborhood. But it takes more time unless there is fundamental labor regulatory reform where our political leaders get together and actually design labor regulations for this century. But that's not a bet that I'd be willing to make on people coming together to come up with some common sense legislation that made sense for the entire U.S. populace. That's a fool's bet right there. So unless you have a comprehensive labor regulatory reform, you're going to just see a continued slow and steady increase. And that increase will continue to be share shift from full-time employees to temp and freelance employees. Most of that will be temp and, and you'll continue to see it. But I think at some point you do hit just peak and then it just stays there. I guess one of the questions is, so if, right, if you're, if you're a business leader and, and maybe you haven't done much in this space, you, you haven't, right, you have just a traditional full-time workforce. Uh, how, how should one get into this gig work uh, world, right? How does one transition into that? What questions should they ask themselves? I would say this, Thomas, if you're not in it now, there are substantive reasons that you're not in it, and I'm not sure that I would rush to go make any changes. Much like I had a conversation, much like my conversation that I alluded to with a CHRO in a manufacturing company, I, if you're not, if you haven't been doing it for the last 20 years, the odds of it suddenly making sense are just low. They're not zero, but they're low. So if you do it, are you doing it in a way that is efficient and is compliant? That you should always be thinking about. You should be thinking about protecting your risk and increasing efficiency. But if you don't do anything today, there are substantive business reasons you don't. It's not because no one's thought of it, right? This is not some new concept that has been around for generations and generations. So if you don't do it, probably continue not doing it. One of the things you mentioned as we started the conversation is that like the, the, I guess the psychographic makeup of the workforce has changed a little bit in the sense that people, I think, want more autonomy, want more independence. What data have you seen or, or what prompts you to make that, make that call? That is a very good question because we are very data driven in the book and this is a tough thing to have data on, right? All we have are surveys. We can tell you anecdotally, if you had told people 20 years ago you were a freelancer, you know what word they associated with freelancer? Unemployed. Oh, you're a freelancer, so you're unemployed. If you tell people today you're a freelancer, you know what word they associate with you? Entrepreneur. Oh, you're an entrepreneur. You're out there hustling, getting it done. That's amazing. So there's just been a shift in the way people see the freelance market, the on-demand market. We can look at surveys as to how satisfied people are with being an on-demand worker. Again, you used to do it because you had no other option. Now it's a lifestyle choice. And so the satisfaction data Again, these are just surveys. They're not hard data like we'll look at it with our friends at the ADP Research Institute or at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, but it's the best we have. And the survey data would tell us increasingly people are very happy with this choice. Not everybody. Some people are still doing it for lack of other options, but for the most part, people that are doing it are very happy with the decision. I would imagine that for any job, you can source it in-house or you can solicit gig work. So people have those options. And I'm curious as to whether there's a point where companies would rather like to have this capability in-house, but the only thing that they can access is gig work. Have you seen anything like that? In other words, right where the job or the freelance opportunity is so attractive that it becomes really impossible for people to source that in-house. You may want to source it in-house, but you don't have the skills. 
in-house, and the skills are in such demand that nobody wants to go in-house, as we discussed earlier. Certainly possible. You can go and get all the skills in-house, but then they'll be underutilized. So we have a team here that's an expert on blockchain security, but we only need to discuss that or write an article about it once a quarter, but I'm paying the person to be here full time? That'd be crazy. So there's a balance between what are the supply and demand structures within that specific job function in your geography, and importantly, what are your utilization rates? Because again, if you only use this skill every now and again for a short period of time, unless there was some massive regulatory reason, some massive business process reason or massive customer reason, why would you ever have that person as a full-time employee? You would just go and engage the person as needed. And that works just fine. It, it really becomes a question of utilization. It becomes a question of skills availability. But this is kind of the promise of total talent management, which is how do we go and do these things in a way that allows for us to look at our entire organization, which includes a huge bunch of freelancers that we might want to engage. Yeah, th th I think it's interesting because I think in your book, you had one example of Estee Lauder and how they built their digital capabilities. Would you mind just re retelling that story? Sure. Look, when they were starting to build out their first websites, their first e-commerce stores, their first digital marketing efforts, those skills were in such high demand, they couldn't hire people. That's the reality in like late 1999, is that they had to engage firms and struggle and come up with on-demand either workers or vendors, because you can consider a small outsourced firm a part of your labor force right? They're a design studio, whatever it is. And so they got their first products out the door because they didn't have a choice. And they got them out of the door by using on-demand resources. Do you think that's the case today? Of course not. In 1999, 1998, whenever it was, there was a skills shortage and it was not overly core to Estee Lauder's business. They weren't selling that much product online. People weren't discovering them online. Fast forward to today. There is no longer a skill shortage on e-commerce experts, social media marketing people, design, digital marketing, websites, things like that. It is also now core to their business. They could not exist without a web presence, without a digital presence, without constantly being at the right place where their customers are thinking about their products and they want to engage with them and blah, blah, blah. So now all those teams are in-house and they're full-time employees. And now if Estee Lauder wanted to do something on the blockchain or wanted to do some advanced AI stuff, well, now they're probably back to freelancers and to subject matter experts. In 20 years, they won't be. So those are great examples of the business need and the skills shortage driving a labor engagement one way 20 years ago versus how we would do it today. Yeah, I think it's a great example that this gig work topic is not just a cost reduction strategy, but it's really, it could also be used to just insource capabilities that you don't have, or at least get started on something and then use that as foundation to build out like a full-time workforce as that becomes more mature, as the need becomes more permanent. So I, I think that's, I think, a really helpful distinction. Jeff, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your perspective on the end of jobs and, and the rise of gig work. I uh, really appreciate it uh, you having me. Thomas, thank you for having me. Always a pleasure to chat. Thanks. All right, let me hit the stop button. We hope you enjoyed this discussion. If you did, be sure to subscribe, like, share, or comment. Until next time, let's make work matter. Mm -hmm.